We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, and that's not Emily because Adam is back. Welcome back, Adam. I'm not Emily again. Thank you. Good You're... to be back. Yes, we, we had you back this past summer for Austria? I want to say. Yes. Yeah, Sounds Austria. Right. Yeah, because Emily is on a deserted island on vacation. Again. And, as she does again. Well, she was moving <laughs> countries last time you were on, which was an ordeal and a process. But Emily right. has left a message for, for us to to state on the podcast. She, she has this verbatim. I sent her a picture of the steak race suits, which were modified to go with the, the flame theme of their cars, which you and I talked about how they actually did look kind of good on TV. And we did see a decent amount of the steak car during the race last right. night. But Emily said, an outfit to match their season up in flames, which <laughs> considering there was a point where Zhou Guan Yu was driving in P9 at about the midpoint of the race and then finished like P13. I, I tracks. genuinely thought they were going to get points last night. I'm a little disappointed that they didn't. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a little bit like, oh, wait, what's happening here? And then he <laughs> slipped all the way the all the way back down to, to the bottom. Usually I we say fun facts for the predictions episodes, but I had a bonus fun fact that I wanted to include because it was Vegas related. But and also one of the things that we love doing on the podcast, as you know, is we love reminding everyone about how old Fernando Alonso is. Mm -hmm. Well, Fernando Alonso is the only <laughs> driver on the grid who was alive when formula one was driving in vegas in the 80s when it was oh, uh, back behind can... caesar's palace so fernando is old you can check that off the window <laughs> cards and yeah he he just beats out lewis hamilton who's a couple years younger than him for um have, having been alive for some of the oldest racing ever right <laughs> crazy yeah i think that's that's just kind of hilarious. like we know that fernando is old <laughs> but that's just absurd like there were be drivers on the grid next year there are drivers on the grid now who were not alive when fernando alonso was racing in formula one which is amazing yeah but speaking of drivers who were alive when fernando was was a young <laughs> actual rookie just a little max, toss. For, max verstappen won his fourth world championship fourth Shocking. Time. first time in uh formula one history that we have back-to-back four-time consecutive Formula One champions. Yes. A fun fact for you. Thank you. That is a fun fact for me. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, that is, that is quite quite the feat. It's quite a mouthful to say, but very exciting. Right, yeah. And, like, the, the best part of it is, like, literally all he had to do was beat one guy. And right. knowing... But, like, knowing Max Verstappen as the type of driver who's like, I need to win every race or my dad will leave me at a petrol station, allegedly. Mm -hmm. But to, to have the fact of, like, going into this, everyone was like, Max, you know the plan is just beat Lando. And he did. Right. Like, he didn't even bother fighting the Ferraris. Obviously, he didn't nope. let the Ferraris <laughs> overtake him. Like, you know, Liam Lawson lets Max by and doesn't fight him. But... He didn't, like, we've seen him fighting Lando this season and, like, the the way that he gets, you know, very tight and, like, a little, people get upset right. about how Max races when he's actually trying to fight someone, like he fought with Lewis in 2021. That didn't happen at all last night. Not even a little bit. Uh, Fry was coming up and he decided to just, you know, let them go by and hold his p place over Lando, which I think is the right move. Yeah, um, especially. Honestly, the, the it's just not was... what I expected out of Max. Right. It's like he, he might be like growing up and maturing a little bit, but the, the track was just so unpredictable and challenging to mm -hmm. navigate and not like navigate because the track is, is a difficult track because it's really not. And right. I still can't get over the fact that we'll lots of straights. Down and... <laughs> it's, it's mostly just straights and some, some very slow corners, but with the weather conditions and the, the way that the tires were, were reacting, like we're lucky we didn't see a safety car at all. Right. I'm honestly shocked that we didn't. I fully expected at least one red flag. Yeah, um, I mean, and we, we almost, almost got one. one courtesy of Pierre Gasly, but yeah. yeah, but we'll talk about Gasly in a second. There's 
commentary, and I think that this will be one of those things that's kind of talked about, you know, in, in postseason postmortems of like, was this world championship fight as difficult as Max's fight with Lewis in 2021? I think, I don't, I think you can't really compare them. Uh, I think you can't compare them, and I don't think it was as difficult. I think the back half of his season was a lot harder, but I think he, they, Red Bull came out the gate so fast this season. Right. And gave him such a cushion and such a lead that the entire second half was about maintaining the lead and watching as people got a little closer and a little closer and a little closer, but it was just about holding the lead instead of really fighting to the nail for it. Right. And honestly, I think Max did get a little mm -hmm. lucky that there was a rain race in Brazil because that yeah. really just, he's one of the best rain race drivers, as we said in, in the reaction episode to that race, that how, how, like that, that really, you know, sealed the deal for him. And, and what was Lando supposed to do? Like ask someone to crash into Max for the next three races. <laughs> like we don't need another crash gate. Right. Yeah. Right, so right. Max becomes the sixth Formula One driver in history to win four or, more, uh, four or more driver's championships. And he joined Sebastian Vettel, who did it in four, four straight years, with, also with Red Bull, and Alain Prost, who did it in 85, 86, 89, and 93, as four Ted World champions tied behind one. Juan Manuel <laughs> Fangio, who has five, and of course, Michael Schumacher and Lewis Hamilton have seven each. So that's wow. ridiculous. He's, this is also the second time uh, a driver has won on back-to-back -back Saturdays, because as you remember from last season, Max won it in the sprint in Qatar, which was a Saturday and right. completely overshadowed Oscar Piastri's first formula win in <laughs> anything. As, as he also completely overshadowed the fact that George w Russell actually won this race. Right. <laughs> um, super fun. The interviews with him got more and more fun as he admittedly was drinking gin and tonic the whole night. Yeah, uh, yeah. And slowly getting more and more drunk on the interviews, which is, I mean, you won the world championship. Might you kind of well. deserve. You've earned that drink. Yeah, exactly. And it's like how, how George was talking on the, the radio at the very end of the race on the cool down lap with, with Toto Wolf. And Toto's like, I'll see you in LA. And he's like, no, I'm staying in nope. Vegas. I'm <laughs> drinking here. Yep. Which yep. is. Again, totally earned, totally deserved. Yeah, and uh, I mean, Mercedes was dominant all weekend in ways that no one expected. I, where did that come out of? Holy cow. Uh, George Russell, huge win. Uh, big props to him. But Lewis Hamilton fighting his way back up, I think, was one of the highlights of that race. Yeah, Lewis is, like... I kind of, I completely forgot how badly Lewis qualified. Mm -hmm. um, he qual he qualified you know P ten and ended up on you know on the podium in, in P two. But I forgot about that. And you know going into the weekend and going into you know the last three weeks have all just been news about how miserable Lewis has been with Mercedes. How he's ready mm -hmm. to go to Ferrari and just get the hell out and stop dealing with these awful Mercedes cars that don't cooperate and try to kill him. And <laughs> Then here we go. There, you know, we've we've got a one two, and it was it was very exciting. If you're a Mercedes fan, which we all know, I am not. <laughs> uh, very exciting for all the Mercedes fans out there. I wonder if this is going to kind of be looked at as his last hurrah moment with Mercedes. I mean, we still have three more races, so we'll see. But uh, if this ends up being the last big moment he has with them, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I they think that. Well, it's it's going to be really interesting because they kind of said in in the post race interviews that like the Mercedes does really well in cold temperatures. This is one of the coldest races of the season. We're right. also going to uh to more deserts for two more night races in Qatar and Abu Dhabi. So this could really help Mercedes and could really benefit them going you know down the stretch and could also throw a little bit of a wrench in McLaren's fight with Ferrari because the more points right. that Mercedes takes away is the more that Ferrari can can try to take advantage of with with everything else on the grid and McLaren did not have the best showing this weekend but we'll get to them in a minute yeah. other notes on Lewis this is his 36th different finish on a podium on a, a different track which is wow that's absurd right <laughs> that's insane 36 yeah. different tracks to podium on Holy cow. Good for yeah. him. I mean, you know, he's not my absolute favorite person on the grid, but it will be, it will be sad to see him leave uh, Mercedes. He has been such a, 
such a, a, a pillar of Formula One for so many years. Yeah. And and this could also kind of maybe be seen as like a passing of the torch from Lewis to, mm-hmm. to George, who will be lead driver next year when <laughs> Kimi Antonelli comes along. What so, a way to spin George's win to make it still about Lewis Hamilton. I say. mean, as one does. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, as Lewis Hamilton... Does. Um, I, 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 we talked about this last night before the race, like Lewis Hamilton rocked up to the track dressed like Dr. Evil from Austin Powers <laughs> and I'm still not over it. Right. Him and, uh, him and George, Dr. Evil and mini me <laughs> saying great Halloween costume idea. When it happens, you can clip this moment. <laughs> yes, exactly. That, that for, for Halloween in a year. Yep. Now- yep. You can clip this right here. <laughs> Yeah, so now let's let's move on to the biggest shit show of the weekend. You know, we we were thinking that the dumb of the weekend was originally going to be when Esteban Ocon went into the pits and didn't pit because Alpine wasn't ready for him, which Alpine, typical. Right. But can we talk about what a mess Ferrari was for all that they finished third and fourth? I, I wanted to pull this up because I wanted to make sure that I quoted this properly. Um, from Brian, Car- quote, Carlos has been told to not overtake. He has been told to not put you under pressure. So just take care of your tile tires. Sainz overtakes. Charles gets on the radio. Maybe try in Spanish. Yeah. I don't so, know how much more you can sum up their race than that moment right there. I mean, yeah, but you there. There's also the additional rant that came at the the end of the race when <laughs> Charles did not know that the radio was still on. Where basically Charles is like, right. "I'm such a nice teammate. I'm such a good person, <laughs> and I keep getting screwed over." But that was for, phenomenal. Now we we have established on the podcast with with me and Emily that Charles is not our favorite Ferrari driver. Mm-hmm. That said. Charles got screwed this weekend in a way that he definitely shouldn't have because mm-hmm. yes, Carlos finishing third on the podium is great. We love as, as the Carlos Sainz fans of the podcast, we love that. But does Ferrari not ha- know how to do math? <laughs> like yeah, serious I, question here. I think that Ferrari just got scared with Max Verstappen breathing down their neck, even though he wasn't actually breathing down their neck. No. And, was more concerned about the uh, 3-4 finish for the constructors than uh, Charles Leclerc. But I think that Charles should have been able to overtake. I think they should have given him the points. I think that uh, there's enough season left that you never know what can happen. And if he ends up just a few points short of Lando Norris for second place... Like, say, three points short of Landon Norris for second place, this is going to be the moment that gets looked at as yeah. the moment that put him in third instead of second. Yeah, and I, I honestly think, because we were talking at the the end of the race, I was like, okay, with, with when Landon Norris went to pit for softs to take fastest lap from Lewis, I said to you, I, I um, now Ferrari has to make Carlos and Charles switch. And I think based right. on the radios and, and based on, on Charles's rant, they did try and, Lu- and not Lewis, um, just like, mm, nah. But yeah. I think going into the, like they have to understand that Charles has a very good chance to take P2 in the championship from Lando. Like this, mm-hmm. like yeah, one, of, it's been less talked about because it's more been focused on the Lando max battle of it all, which I really think that they should have pivoted that, you know, conversation after Sao Paulo when max picked up, you know, maximum amount of points, right. but they should have gone into this weekend with the understanding of giving Charles as many points as possible to try to, you know, get P2 from Lando, especially because the next race is Qatar where Ferrari's not great. Right. Yeah. They got to get those points now while they have the opportunity to, while they can. Yeah. It, Cause you know, mm-hmm. yes, Charles is only 21 points back of Lando. Lando has 340 points. Charles has 319, but three extra points that would make it 18 points back. If I did my math correctly, which we all know is, is completely <laughs> questionable, but that's three extra points. That's, you know, that is it. That is a, a whole position. And I understand that like 
Carlos is just ready to, to get out of Ferrari and be at Williams and be a Williams driver. And this is definitely not helping. And there, there have been, you know, all these rumors about internal strife, which like, duh, because Carlos got fired in favor of Lewis Hamilton, right. not fired, but we all know what we mean, but there's, there's really no reason why Ferrari shouldn't have gone into this weekend and said, or, or we have to give Charles max points, Carlos, you have to help him out here. Um, I think it's just more of Ferrari strategy being Ferrari strategy and they're going to need to come up with something new when Hamilton is there. Otherwise we're going to hear, uh, there's going to be lots of, um, community service time. So. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> Though I, I have, we have mentioned already that, you know, Charles is about to learn about how Carlos feels right now at Ferrari, but it's, like this is this is a job that Valtteri Bottas used to do at Mercedes. Like he mm-hmm. like he understood that his role was to make sure that Lewis Hamilton got exactly what he needed. There were a lot right. of times where he wasn't happy about it. We have the the famous Valtteri it's James radio exchange. The point back to of like, you know, it wasn't always the the best, but like that is a very important role when you have somebody who's trying to fight for a certain position. So The fact and the fact that Ferrari is just like not capable of doing it anymore when like that's exactly what they did back in the days of Michael Schumacher and Rubens Barrichello. Like Rubens Barrichello got screwed over how many times in favor of Michael Schumacher? It'll be really interesting to see Ferrari, if they grow a spine next year, uh, which driver they end up prioritizing. Well, I think we all know which driver they're going to prioritize. I think we all know which one they're going to prioritize and I don't think it's the right decision, but you know. I mean, I I think that they've really kind of shot themselves in the foot with the precedence that they've set. But if we all know something in, in Formula One and precedence is that sometimes that gets thrown out the window or just blatantly ignored. And yes, I am talking about yep. the maximum lap time penalties. But <laughs> anyway, speaking of penalties, as as we all know, last year, Carlos Sainz had to take a grid penalty because the Formula One track itself tried to murder his car. And right. so Carlos finishing on the podium is a little bit of like getting one back from, you know, the bad feelings in Vegas last right. year. But we saw in the cool down taxi ride in the Rolls Royce that the that was not the happy car. The happy car was Max and GP. This this right. was was. Lewis did not want to be in that car. George, of course, was happy to be in that car. And then Carlos Poor was Poor George just stuck like, in the middle seat. Right. He, I think he's the, the tallest person of all time. And he's like crammed into that middle. Like, I, I, I maintain that, like, I get Vegas and I get the spectacle. But we don't, do we really need to drive them from the start-finish straight to the Bellagio Fountains just for interviews? No. It, I really, and I know we talked about this the other day, I think that they'll do one more race here, and I think Vegas will continue, but I think it'll get moved off the strip. I think they tried, they tried to make it this big spectacle, but really what they've done more of is put Vegas into Formula One than they've put Formula One into Vegas. And I think it really needs to, it needs to remain a Formula One-centered event, which means doing the things the way that they do in Formula One and not making it all different because it's Vegas. I think it needs to turn into more of a normal and expected race. And I think it needs to move off of the strip, personally. Yeah. It's not like there's not space, you know, right. maybe next to like Allegiant Stadium or something, or maybe the Caesars Palace parking lot again. Like they, they could always <laughs> go back there, except I don't think the parking right. lot looks the same as it did in 1982. No. But yeah, it's. We, we've talked about this, that the, the Las Vegas contract as it currently stands is until 2025. So next season, because this is, of course, the mm. podcast that only ever talks about the future. But <laughs> we but I just don't see Las Vegas and especially the casinos continuing with this four month disruption for a let's right. call it a three day mm. event that has you know casinos are already upset Mm. because of the way that access gets blocked with the grandstands that they put up obviously they Mm. have to like put metal sheeting on the bridges so that people don't throw things down onto the track for the on the pedestrian bridges like all of it is and it's just it's and of course and yet still uh a bag a plastic bag got stuck in a formula one car yesterday yes in george's formula (laughs) one car i believe 
Yeah. But and and even and even let's let's talk about the race start time. We we were in Arizona. It was eleven o'clock at night. We were both right. very tired by the end of it. I didn't get to bed until two o'clock in the morning, which is not exactly uncommon when I'm watching Formula <laughs> One races. But it wasn't even like a very convenient start time in the UK where most of the Formula One audience is. It's ridiculous that you've created a start time where it's because it seems like most of Formula One is either convenient for the location that they're at or convenient for the bulk of their location. And because Vegas is trying to be Vegas, again, uh, it's inconvenient for both. I know plenty of people here in the States who did not watch the race because they didn't want to start a race at 11 p.m. Or if you're on the East Coast, 2 a.m. You know? Yeah, I, exactly. I just, I think that they need to um, really focus on Formula One, on the racing itself over the venue. Yeah, exactly. And I think we see that in most other places. Yeah, and I mean, like, even Qatar is going to be a, like, local time is going to be 7 o'clock at night, which is fine like that's it that's a decent right. start for for a night race and i mean you even have, have races that kind of like start at sunset and you know those and like those are those are fine but we have to have a 10 o'clock at night local time start because for or not for but las vegas doesn't want las vegas boulevard to be shut down during the day and i understand that but also right then then you have to move it off the strip Mm -hmm. And if you just look at tickets, I mean, I know both years they've had a ton of extra tickets that end up going really cheap right before. They are not bringing in the crowds that they had hoped to bring in. Yeah, um, and I think it's crowds were lower than last year, too. Right. It's a, it's a spectacle, and people kind of – you can't turn away, especially if you're following and watching Formula One. It's a key race. You've got to watch it. But – it's not bringing thing bringing people to Vegas. It's not bringing the attention that they had hoped it has. And I really think that 2026, we either will not be back in Vegas or it'll be a very, very different race. We can we can only hope. But I we mean, like, had I not been dog sitting, we probably would have just gotten in the car and driven to Vegas and gone like super last minute. We that probably yeah. would have happened. But no, I mean the and and as as had been said many times on the broadcast, the only good time for this race was in Australia and Guam, which is a United States protectorate. Right. <laughs> and that's just that's not that's not very helpful. And and like you said, it's not even a convenient time for most of the United States where the race is. Right. So, so and I think I that's think, a kicker. I think the FI has shot themselves in the foot with this one. Yeah, exactly. Especially since this is a um form this is one of the few Formula One owned races. And I want to take a pause here real quick because UCLA women's basketball just upset South Carolina, who has not oh. lost a game in like a year and a half. <laughs> so this is very exciting sports happenings right now. Anyway, to go back to <laughs> this actual podcast, let's talk about the constructors for a bit because the constructors let's championship is still up in the air. Max has won the driver's championship. That is over. Constructors is still it is happening. And mm -hmm. So right now, McLaren is in the lead with 608 points. They're, um, they are 24 points ahead of Ferrari with two Grand Prix and a sprint to go. So it's really up in the air. And technically, Red Bull is also still in contention. They're 29 points back I mean... Ferrari. But they only have one driver. So yeah. that's definitely not actually going to happen. But if Ferrari can overcome their pains in Qatar, we could be in mm. for a very exciting constructors finish in Abu Dhabi. I think that'd be great. I'd love to see that. Yeah, I think if, we, if it's anything like we saw the other night, I think Ferrari can really put a dent in it. Uh, they've got to get to number one. They've got to get some actual race wins and not just threes and fours because uh, they'll keep right. getting those points. But I don't know if they... I don't know if they don't get to the top of the podium, they can really make that difference up. Yeah. And, and I don't think anyone expected McLaren to, to perform this poorly in, in Vegas. Right. Like they, they really, the fact that they were really not in contention for a podium at all was, I don't, I don't think anybody expected that. I mean, even Mercedes going into it or like, we don't know how, why, why we're doing well. Like that's very confusing, right. but McLaren has, 
by far the fastest car on the grid right now. So how did they, you know, settle for what P P six P seven and a distant <clears throat> P six P seven. Yeah. It's uh McLaren's got to step up if they want to keep that gap because Ferrari's breathing down their neck, but Ferrari also has to step up and really take charge of these races and, uh, and have better not strategies. Settle for, yeah. They've got to get two drivers up on the podium, preferably one in first. Uh, if they want to see this overcome, so we'll see. Yeah, and also I think to 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 add to to McLaren's issues is that like Oscar Piastri, who we we all know that I I prefer, is he's been <laughs> relatively quiet lately, and he he really hasn't been turning in the 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 same performances that he had been only a couple months ago. Right, he uh he's kind of hitting a cold spot, so. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Uh, hopefully they can, they can light a fire uh, before the end of the season. Yeah, th- this, could, this could and should be a very, very exciting, interesting battle that will definitely go down to Abu Dhabi. And right. we can only hope that we don't hear the same Ferrari radio calls. And maybe Ferrari <laughs> just needs to let Carlos be chief strategist and like let him do that and drive the car. Because that does right. tend to work out better for them. <laughs> so we can only hope. Yeah. One and can then, hope. Yeah. And then on the other side of the Constructors' Championship, which is obviously not as prestigious as, you know, focusing on who's going for first, but the battle for P6 is actually very tight right now in a way that we all kind of didn't expect. Like, obviously, <sighs> Alpine's performance in Sao Paulo rocketed them up to six. But Huge, then yeah. they had a disaster of a weekend here in Vegas. And so Hulk finishing in P8 has moved them back up ahead to P6. And there are only four points in between Haas and V-Carb, who are uh, is in six, seven, in, in eighth. So that is very unexpected. And also, like, there's millions of dollars in each of these positions. So right. it's anyone's mm-hmm. game right now. And Yuki also scored points in, in the V-Carb today. So it's that will also be one of the things to look at going into Abu Dhabi to see, you know, what team is going to be in the, the best position and also what team is going to kind of have the most wind tunnel time, which right now will right. be stake. And I think, uh, yeah, uh, I think... For these teams, it's going to come down less to doing well and more to just staying in one piece. The team that is good enough will come out P6. Yeah, probably. And 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 right now, that kind of does look like Haas. Yeah. Wouldn't Which, have guessed it at the beginning of the season. but No, no, really. I mean, we all kind of hoped, but we also thought that, like, Williams would be a lot better than they are. And obviously... Yeah. Williams Williams had a rough weekend. If we if we move into who disappointed, Williams like they can just they just can't catch a break right now. No. Those poor those poor mechanics. Yeah, the, every time and this is of course mostly just Franco. Anytime Franco crash, it's like, "Oh god, not again." Cuz and right. between The beginning of the Sao Paulo Grand Prix weekend, which was obviously a sprint weekend and a rainy sprint weekend to Las Vegas, there were five crashes by the Williams car (laughs) in not even two races because the last Williams crash was prior to the Vegas Grand Prix. So that's that's absurd. And the fact that they were able to get the cars, you know, back to their their base in Grove repaired, which they actually have a really great video of getting the cars back from Sao Paulo and getting them ready for Vegas, which is very impressive that they were able to manage that. Yeah, Yeah. it's on YouTube on the the Williams F1 channel, but I highly recommend watching. It's like a 12-minute bit. But, like, that's just awful. Franco had one of the worst crashes that we've had this season, which it was a 50 G crash left him, you know, questionable for the race. And then of course, Albon, um, his radiator failed forcing retirement in the middle of the race. Yeah. Like why, why can't Williams catch a break? This entire season has just <sighs> been absurd. Yeah. It's been crazy and unfortunate. And, um, I really think that so much of it comes down to just driver error. As we've seen. I mean, the radiator, what can you do? But yeah, it's, I, I think, unfortunately, uh, Colapinto, he's a good driver, but I think it's going to be hard for anyone after this season to look at him and take him seriously 
uh, putting him in a car in future seasons. I think less so putting him in a car, but putting him in a top tier car. Like there have been a lot of questions about like Franco going to Red Bull and the the real question here, you know, besides, you know, who's going to take the second Red Bull seat next year is what's it going to take for Red Bull to get rid of Sergio Perez? Like seriously. I was going to say if Checo's still there, I might not put it past them at all. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) I mean, we talked about this last night, like what's, what's it going to take? It it's it's kind of it's kind of, and I, I and we know that the answer is that Sergio Perez has a lot of very wealthy financial backers that brings in a lot of money right. to the team, but and and we've also said that there or there we have seen and and I think Helmut Marco who just we know that Helmut Marco says things and he's not always to be believed but there will be a shareholder meeting after Abu Dhabi that will you know make the decisions but. It wouldn't mm-hmm. surprise me with the way that they've gone if they just keep Checo still, even though Checo is clearly not doing what Red Bull needs to do to be a successful constructor. Yeah, I think Red Bull is putting all of their focus on Max and winning the the title and is kind of just leaving Checo to his own devices. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And he somehow managed to finish P10, but, like, that's not where Red Bull needs their second car, because, like, come on. Yeah. It's it's hard to applaud someone for finishing P10 on the same night that your co-driver wins the World Drivers' Championship. That's a hard. So. Yeah. So then... That is a question that we, you know, continue to not be able to answer because Red Bull is just mystifying us in their insistence on keeping him. But here's the real question. Pierre Gasly's engine blew three laps into the race. Does this mean that he has now cost his team in damage (sighs) money or is he still in the clear? I brought this up to you last night and I really think that, uh, you can't blame an engine going out on the driver. And I think that his record should stay clean. I think this should still be a continuation of his uh, perfect, or I guess perfect failure in the Destructors Championship. Yeah, I mean, in, in the sense of he did not cause them accident damage, I think right. this still does apply, but I also think that like he seriously got jinxed going into this, like leaving aside the fact that he said somehow finished um, qualifying in, in qualified P3, which don't understand how that happened. But right. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, it, the, I think that he was very seriously jinxed by everyone talking about the fact that he hadn't cost the team anything in accident damage. Yeah. Which I still don't think he has. But, I don't think he has. But still, that that engine did cause damage to that car. They did they did show um, some footage of him getting out of the car in the garage, and you can see bits of nice carbon fiber. Le- nice nice hole in the back when when the car when the car went the engine went poof. So yeah, fun. Other bits of note: at Aston Martin's sporting director Andy Stevenson had his 600th Grand Prix race with the same organization this weekend in Crazy. Vegas, which is absurd. Because actually, I want to I want to look this up and get the actual number. Um, Formula One has had, let's see, uh, by what season? Where where are we? Uh, Las Vegas Grand Prix coming. Here we are. La- the Las Vegas Grand Prix was the 1,123rd Grand Prix race in the history of Formula One. And this guy from Aston Martin has been there for 600 of them. starting so more than with- half of the existence of Formula One. Exactly. That's absurd. Wow. And he- so he started with Jordan, which we've talked about the, the kind of the beginnings and how Aston Martin became to be a thing in our genealogy series. And Aston Martin was one of our favorites because we talked about Force India. So if you haven't watched right. that yet, go watch that. It'll be linked above if you're watching on YouTube. But that's so many races. And to do that in technically the same organization with the way that teams get, you know, bought out and renamed, that's also like completely unheard of. of. Yeah. Yeah. How does that happen? He's been out there almost as long as Fernando Alonso, which is (laughs) unreal. (laughs) Very good. Very good. (laughs) 
So let us get into our predictions. You shockingly picked a George Pohl, a George Lewis Carlos podium, and a Checo P10. So you went, uh, you went perfect. And by that, I mean we totally forgot that you needed to do picks before, before the race started. But Emily and I we did can just picks assume that We can just assume that I'm perfect in every way and Obviously. would have gotten it 100%. I'm cool with that assumption. Do you all see what I have to put up with day in and day out? Like, really? Thank you. So pole position was George. I had Charles, which is a completely reasonable prediction. And Emily had Mm. Max, which could also have been a reasonable prediction, but also still not the fastest car on track. So Emily was a bit of a stretch. I I think could have been Max had Red Bull brought the correct rear wing. Okay, so the thing, it's it's good that you brought up the the rear wing issues. I I think Helmet Marco was taking out of context because I think that they clarified in that they didn't have a correct rear wing at all like there were questions of like could something have been brought in from Milton Keynes um last minute which the answer was no because Vegas is very inconvenient from Europe obviously but so yeah so so Red Bull very very famously just carved little divots into the top of their rear wing just (laughs) you know for funsies but Red Bull I don't believe had a rear wing, rear wing that w- that at all that would have been beneficial for the conditions in yeah. Vegas. And not only were the conditions freezing cold, which meant that tires were freaking ridiculous, but also it was very windy. Mm-hmm. And that just doesn't help at all. Not at all. Yeah. So then podium predictions. Podium was George Lewis Carlos. I had Charles Oscar Lando and Emily had Charles Max Lando. So... We both picked the wrong Ferrari driver and put him in the wrong position. Oops. As one does. Then P10, as as we said earlier, was Sergio underperforming Perez. I picked Kevin Magnuson, who qualified in this uh, a position that could have gotten the, him there and emily had lance stroll who did actually manage to start the race and therefore has now become the most experienced canadian uh driver in formula one history right not that he did anything with that but the aston martin season has just been a disaster so okay And then for biggest surprise and who's going to do a dumb, my prediction was that there wasn't going to be any nonsense with the new race director. And shockingly, there wasn't. And also shockingly, we've had some like good feedback from the drivers of this new race director. So I'm not saying it's going to be smooth sailing, but they might hate him slightly less than they hated Niels Vidic. And I'm not saying that Nails Vita should should have been fired going into Vegas because I think that that was dumb. And especially the way the FIA said that he resigned when he's like, yeah, no, I got fired on the way to Geneva going to a meeting. So, no, I did not step down. But, you know, remains to be seen. Mohammed Ben Salim, notably absent during the awards ceremony. Nowhere to be found, (laughs) which as he tends to do when he, you know, when he steps in it, then he kind of just goes quiet for the next few races. We'll probably see him in Qatar and Abu Dhabi, of course, but we had a little bit of a break from him in Vegas. And I don't think that he wanted to give George the first place finisher medal anyway, considering George is the leader of the (laughs) drivers association. They released that statement calling him out and the FIA has still yet to respond. So cute. And Emily's prediction was there wasn't going to be a safety car, which big surprise there was not. And then, for who's going to do a dumb, we were both wrong. I said that Mercedes was going to step in it and Mercedes finished one, two. And Emily said that um, just the Vegas Grand Prix itself was going to be the dumb, but it was actually, you know, pretty calm and, and not as ridiculous. I think the most ridiculous part of the weekend was the fact that they threw Danica Patrick out of a helicopter to get her to the <laughs> track and, you know, for all the ridiculousness that's around this race, uh, and I could talk about that all day. Uh, as far as the actual racing goes, it was a pretty solid race. Yeah, which is exactly like it was last year. We had a good race that what, unlike last year, wasn't even impacted by you know weird shenaniganery that right. know, we, we didn't have we, anything that well i didn't have to stay up until five o'clock in the morning watching race coverage <laughs> because a you know whole cover decided to kill a formula one car so and no one got awesome. kicked out of the stands before watching what they paid to watch 
Yes, also that in case you forgot, you know, because um, the the, sta the the union staff members uh, were working for the track going into FP2 last year, they they had to clock out. So there was nobody to, you know, supervise the 30 people that decided to stay up until four o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning yeah. to to watch the, the practice session. So everyone got kicked out, which was also kind of dumb, but as one does. But uh, final thoughts. What did you think? I thought it was a good race. I think it was solid. Um, it's always nice to see a race that goes all the way through uh, without a safety car, without any kind of stopping. I think lots of pit lane shenanigans. Uh, but overall, I think a really exciting and fun race to watch. Yeah, it was, it was another it was another good one. I wouldn't say it was like an absolute banger of a race. and But I also right. don't think it was like even that much of a letdown compared to like the masterclass we saw in Sao Paulo, but it was, it was, it was a solid race. It wasn't as, as absurd. Speaking of pit lane shenanigans, um, I'm still shocked that Carlos Sainz didn't get a penalty for, you know, Absolutely jerking, amazed. jerking himself yeah. out of the, the pit lane when Ferrari called him in to pit and then said, don't because they weren't ready. And like, that's so dumb of Ferrari. Yeah. And should he had just driven like i i fully thought that he should have just driven through what used to be called a drive through penalty back when they used to to throw those out there but he he didn't he yeeted himself back onto the racing line and, pardon and somehow managed to to not get a penalty for that which is definitely right. not a legal move so, so interesting anyway for our off track moment of the weekend there were actually a few off track moments of the weekend. I don't know if you saw this, but uh, did you see any of the quotes about the weed? Uh, yes, apparently all of the drivers were going to test positive because of the overbearing smell. Yeah, which reminded me of my life in college when I would wake up to, you know, my, my roommate who I shared a bathroom with coughing because he had to wake and bake every morning, um, yep. which, uh, <laughs> oh, beautiful, wonderful college memories. But yeah, that wonderful, I think wonderful. that was... Only in Vegas, but also only only what happened to Yuki Tsunoda is Yuki Tsunoda was almost denied entry into the United <laughs> States, which hilarious. A hilarious. Um, B like it, and it's not even like, you know, look at this guy like he's a world famous Formula One driver because he was, you know, a tiny Japanese man in his pajamas. Right. But the the underlying thing to this is I don't think he had his visa paperwork on him like that's what i had been hearing afterwards and if so then yeah it's his fault that he almost denied entry into the united states yeah which is wild and changes the narrative of that so much yeah a little bit it, it, it's like you know yeah you can say i am a world famous formula one driver traveling with my physio who you know with the way that customs and border patrol works like he was in a room by himself and English is not his first language. Explaining right. things is, is, you know, not easy. Very, very difficult. So this could have become a bigger problem. And especially if it is true that Yuki did not have the correct visa paperwork with him, because obviously he needed that visa paperwork for the other two Formula One races, including Stin, which was not even a month ago. So right. uh, big oops. Big oops. Yeah. But also it's just like only Yuki. Yeah. Yeah. He also like crashed into one of the speed limit signs in the pit lane during the race last night, <laughs> which uh, they, they talked about it, po you know, afterwards. It, it wasn't on the broadcast, but I was like, oh, Yuki. Oh, Yuki. Brilliant. And then so. last but not least, the Formula One movie was filming in Vegas uh, this weekend. They they did. True. They fil they filmed some shots. Uh, spoiler alert. And you can mute this if, if you don't want to be spoiled. But apparently Brad Pitt crashes in <gasps> um, in Vegas. Spoilers. And it's very dramatic. And there was um, I saw some footage on Instagram of him flopping down yeah. onto a mat <laughs> as he collapses. So clearly he's going to lose some consciousness and it's going to be very dramatic. I am very excited to see this movie. It'll be very cool to be lining up uh, scenes from the movie with scenes that we saw being filmed and also with scenes from real races uh, that they've just superimposed Brad Pitt's car onto. 
Right, which they did in so. um, Pierre Gasly's car in the trailer. They showed a bit from um, Eau Rouge in Belgium, where it looks like it's Brad Pitt's car, but it was actually digitally altered from Pierre Gasly's Alpine from 2023. Right. So it'd be very interesting to to see and for people who are more eagle-eyed than I am to pick out those bits. <laughs> During the grid walk, Jerry Bruckheimer said to Martin Brundle that they will be also filming in Abu Dhabi um, on the way to the release, which will be in June of next year. And hopefully Hopefully I am not hiking the weekend that the movie comes out. If not, yes. I might have to disappear from the hike for a couple of hours <laughs> to go see a movie. I'll fly, I'll fly out to, uh, I'll fly out to California. We can go see the movie. Yes, exactly. Perfect. So cool. thanks again for being here, Adam. And Thank letting you for me, having me. Le letting me talk at you for, for almost an hour and also <laughs> watching the race with me last night. Um, up next will always, be our, our Qatar Grand Prix predictions with another guest host to be named later. And thanks for going off track with us, guys. Thank you so much.